I'm Esther Hare. I'm, I was born in India of missionary parents in 1921. My dad was a registered nurse. And he went there because it was easy to get British subjects in there. They didn't have to get a visa. And we lived very happily in a very isolated place. There were four Europeans, my mother, my dad, my sister, and me. And everything we said in the house had to be spoken in English. But the minute we left the house, nobody spoke English, so we spoke in a different language. That language was Santali, which was, I call it, my second mother tongue. Dad was very good at the language. They, you know, they had to take a year's language study, and I was, that's why I was born up in Missouri. They went up in Missouri with their language teacher and for a whole year. And there was a Scottish mission. Uh, he was an eye man. He did a lot of cataracts, about 17 miles from the railroad station. And uh, he was the one that gave the final test in this language because he was good at it. And the tests were always given on Wednesday. We lived about, I don't know, quite a distance away from But anyhow, Dad went, and the, the final, this, this was a, a missionary doctor, and so all of the language study was given with missionary work in mind. And one of the things a missionary has to do is to preach. And so his final exam was to be able to preach a short, I mean, a, um, the, the, what do you call it? The, well, the midweek prayer meeting, that's the prayer meeting that you had. You had to give a short prayer meeting sermon. And so dad had prepared this. And so when he went to give his test, the, the examiner said, look, you're good enough. I've got a congregation out there waiting. Go out and give your sermon. So my poor dad, the first time he ever gave a public talk, he gave a public but then after that, he had the language because nobody else knew the language. And I don't know that mother took the test, but she was just as good as he was. She spoke very good Santali. And so that's how he got started, working out in the field, because in medicine, you have to find out. And it's kind of interesting that he did many things as a missionary nurse that many doctors have never seen. Because out there, everybody had everything and no help. And then we, we had a leper call, uh, village right very close to us. Poor thing, awful condition. And, and people had smallpox all the time. And one of my stories is, I'll just tell you this quickly. Uh, he was, there's a place about 25 miles from where we were that there was a little interest and a lot of, and almost everybody there was covered with smallpox marks, you know, the scars. And so dad, you know, the Hindus think that the thing that you have, the vaccination has cow's blood in it. And that cow's sacred, you mustn't do that. So they wouldn't get vaccinated. And so when he went up there, he was trying to encourage the people because there were so many sick to get vaccinated. And nobody would get vaccinated. But there was one couple and their two little kids that spoke this language that he was able to get to. And he begged them let me try it. It can't hurt you. You're not a Hindu. You're an animist. So he vaccinated these people. And when the epidemic came, umpteen people in the village got smallpox. And these four people didn't get smallpox. And in the meantime, my mother taught them how to look after their children. The, they never used diapers on their kids. They just dropped wherever they wanted to. And all of these feces would be lying around. And of course, germs, sickness. And so she taught them, you know, how to feed their kids and so forth. So it was really basic health and that kind of thing first. And then you give them religion. In about 1925-26 in that area, uh, my dad got the idea that uh, cholera was something that was really bad in our area. And it seems like before the rainy season started, there'd be an epidemic. When the rains came, it kind of washed a lot of the bugs away. But we had a big pond fairly near to us. And the people used to use it for everything. They washed their clothes in it. They washed their bodies in it. They don't use toilet paper out there. They use water. And they use the pond for that purpose also, for anything that you want. And they drank the water. Well, when cholera season came, we had cholera people just dying like flies. And one, we had a gardener that used to help us with the garden. We had a pretty big garden because it wasn't a market. 
And one couple of days he didn't show up for work. And this was about 25, 26, somewhere in that area of time when I was just three or four. And because I remember this very distinctly, it was very famous. But anyway, why isn't he at work? And when he went to find out, he, oh, he has cholera. We've all left him. He's going to die anyhow. We don't want to get cholera. So we've left him so we won't get sick. And so he's there. And so my dad gathered up all of his equipment. Since he was a registered nurse, he knew what to do. And he went and he, I think they have to keep them hydrated and keep water going through and I, whatever he did. But anyhow, he stayed there two days and two nights, just stayed right there with the Mahdi, just helping him. And he got cured. And it made an enormous impression on the people. Because, you know, in those days, anybody that was white was considered superior. And these are untouchables. And ordinarily, they have no contact. And that this guy would come to an untouchable and endanger his own life to save his life. All of a sudden, they were able then, all of a sudden, to get the story of Jesus that he was telling. Because isn't that what Jesus did? He helped people. And it was, it was really, there are several things like that that, that happened that, that helped make an opening for you. And it wasn't because he was stuck up. He, Dad just was that kind of a guy. He ran a dispensary and he doled out free medicines and did all kinds of medical work while he did missionary work. Instead of preaching first, which they don't want to listen to. You know, even a Hindu, when he sees something like that, he says, hey, he must have something that I don't have, right?